Happy to have everyone here again. And with Jonathan and Brett, we welcome everybody. And we have a very good class tonight number, and we hope that all are interested in the continuing the study after we've uh, finished with a good lesson from Jonathan. We're in uh, 1 Peter, and we had gotten into verse 12. I read verse 12 last week and said there were a number of sermons in it, but I wouldn't try to go into it then. But I need to uh, back up to verse 10 and bring us up to verse 12 again to remind us that we're in the section of this letter where Peter is describing the work of the Old Testament prophets and even makes some reference to, to the apostles. And that starts in verse 10 because he says concerning the salvation uh, as to the prophets and their uh, seeking and searching diligently into it with the uh, prophets, uh, the prophecies that they had made. So they not only studied one another, that is the different prophets, but they studied also what the Holy Spirit had revealed through them uh, concerning these particular matters, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. I think it's interesting, though I didn't mention it last week, that the idea uh, is to seek out, the idea of seeking is to seek out, to diligently search, and to actually scrutinize the matter. They were getting all they could out of what God had revealed to try to figure out the time that these things would take place. And it is interesting that when you come down to verse 11, that he says, searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Uh, the words in the original language, the Koine Greek, are different as far as uh, time. When he says to what time, he uses the word chronos. And then by what manner of time, he uses the Greek word kairos. But what he's actually saying by using those two words, well, they had a little different flavor in the Greek and meaning. The chronos time is simply uh, duration, denoting duration. Uh, the lapse of moments, one second by another second, by a minute, by an hour, and so on. But Kairos describes the seasons or the periods, you know, the epochs. We've talked about in right dividing the word of truth and searching the scriptures on Sunday morning about the three great ages in which God has dealt with man on earth, the first being the patriarchal age period of some 2,500 years from Genesis 1-1 down to Exodus 20 where the law was given by God to Moses for the Jews Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5 and it lasted 1,500 years and the Jews approached God under the law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood and then of course the law was taken out of the way and nailed across Colossians to 14 and uh, replaced by the New Testament system, the Christian age. And thus the church began in Acts chapter 2, as Luke records. And that age has been around for 2,000 years and will continue until the end of time. Well, put yourself back. I know it's an impossibility, but for sake of our purpose here, put your mind back to the time the prophets lived. And he's talking about Old Testament prophets. And they were doing their best to figure out the exact moment. And if they couldn't do that, at least the great age in which God would perform these very things that they knew applied to the Messiah, who, of course, is the Christ. Remember, Jesus means Savior. Christ means anointed. And as I said on numerous occasions, Apostle Paul many times would say, Christ Jesus, meaning anointed Savior. Anointing means the way that they said this is official. He's the real thing, if you please. So when they did this, this, this brings to mind some ideas 
that we run into in the New Testament. You remember in Acts 1, and I rather, yes, Acts 1, and I, I think about verse 6 all the way through verse 8, that the Lord said concerning the question the apostles put to him before he left this earth and went back to heaven, Lord will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the time, and that's the Greek word chronos, or season, and that's the Greek word kairos, which the Father has set within his own authority. But one thing that definitely establishes is that God wanted certain people to know certain things, but that others, other things he didn't want them to know, at least at a certain period or at a certain time. So the prophets are represented as searching for the time when the events pertaining to the Christ involving his suffering, which had been mentioned, were to occur. Notice that they bore witness. They testified of what? Before they took place, beforehand, of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They did that by the Spirit of Christ. And last week we pointed out that the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Uh, you might want to write down Romans chapter 8, verse 9 as a proof text for that. In Galatians chapter 4, and verse 6. Romans 8, verse 9. In Galatians 4 and verse 6. So there's some things we learn about this. First of all, the Holy Spirit was guiding the apostles. They did not depend upon their own learning. They didn't depend upon their own ability to recall and to remember. But the Holy Spirit used them to write down the things that we have in the Bible. And that, of course, is true to every inspired writer, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. And that same spirit that had influenced in the way I've described the prophets, the right of the sufferings of the Christ, as far as they were concerned, in their future. And the scriptures that were delivered by them were studied diligently to try to figure out when these things would take place. So... This same spirit that influenced them influenced the apostles and the inspired men, other inspired men who wrote the Bible, such as James and Luke and so on. So this is the reason you have what is said in 2 Peter chapter 1, 20 and 21, where Peter said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Now watch the next verse. But whole, but the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we'll mention this later on. We'll probably need to be reminded of it. But moved by the Holy Ghost in the Greek language means they were born up beyond their own powers by God and guided along to write down exactly what he wanted written down. Now, it's true he used them and their learning and their vocabulary to do it, but he selected the words that they had that would say what he wanted said in the Revelation in inspiring the truth. So we have that brought out, and I think that's interesting. As I said, we'll, we'll bring that back out when we get to Second Peter. But going ahead and looking, um, at this point the spirit of Christ the Holy Spirit having been in the Old Testament prophets it follows then that Christ existed during the times of the prophets and this verse thus becomes a very important text in support of the deity and the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus. And that ties in with John 1, 1 and 2, and 1 John 1, 1 through 3, which we have studied not that many weeks ago, 
that declares plainly in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. Then in verse 14, when the Word became flesh, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when people try to say Christ had a beginning, such as the Job's witnesses and certain others, uh, this passage here, along with many others, makes it clear that that's just not the case, that the spirit of Christ is back there in the prophets, writing down these things concerning the sufferings of the Christ. Now, when we come on down now to verse 12, where we left off last week, the scripture simply reads, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but themselves being prophets, those that searched diligently and scrutinized what they had revealed through them and the other prophets, about the time these things concerning the Christ and his sufferings would actually take place. Unto us they did minister, that is, these things were actually being written for those who would live under the Christian age. So this shows us how that these things join together, that there is down through the stream of time, God unfolding how he would save man. I might emphasize here what I've said at other times. I don't know I've said it lately, but uh, I pointed out that uh, Christianity is a historical religion. You can trace it through the history of man. It makes it rather unique when you realize that God in saving man, doing for man what he couldn't do for himself from his own sin, would work through men as they developed and did this, that, or the other down through history. And God, knowing all that is the object of knowledge, he is omniscient, and he's being all-powerful, that he could work these things to bring all of this about and bring it into existence. And that should cause us to realize and take great strength. And that's what Peter's trying to get over to the brethren who originally received this letter, that they should not be borne down and called to be depressed and give up their faith because they're being persecuted by those who opposed them, those who hated them, those who rejected the gospel message. So we should also draw that same kind of strength from these messages as it was originally intended. So it is, of course, continued to be intended to accomplish the same with Christians throughout the whole of time. So to whom it was revealed, not unto themselves, but unto you did they minister these things. Uh, I won't do this now, but it hasn't been that long ago when we went through Hebrews. But I urge you to go and read the book of Hebrews because that's exactly what's being said by the inspired writer of the Hebrews, he's writing part of the New Testament concerning the Old Testament worthies all the way back to patriarchy and down through the Mosaical age. Because if you look at um, Hebrews chapter 11, all those great men, the Holy Spirit had the inspired writers select as great examples of faithful obedience to God through much turmoil and persecution. None of them were Christian. They were all living under either the patriarchal age, the father rule period, time of Abraham and all that, and through the time of the Jews approaching God through the law of Moses in the Mosaical dispensation. So it's by means of revelation that it was made known to the ancient prophets that the matters which occasion them to give these prophecies uh, which in the New Testament we see fulfilled that it was not to be in their day in other words if they learned anything from their scrutinizing of those prophecies that they themselves had delivered and other prophets had delivered in the Old Testament time it was that it was not for them to understand those things but it was for those who would come in the years ahead and uh, it had reference then to other people and that's important for us to recognize he says uh, then 
in the next part of verse 12, uh, the things which are now reported unto you, as I just mentioned, by them that have preached the gospel unto you. Well, we know the fulfillment of these things through the gospel message. Again, let me remind you, I've done it several times, but it's the prime example of what we're talking about. When Philip approached the Ethiopian eunuch, he was himself pondering who Isaiah the prophet was speaking in Isaiah chapter 53. And he himself said, as Luke records, of himself, he's speaking of himself or some other man. Well, notice that Philip began at the same verse and preached unto him Jesus. And that's the way all of the Old Testament prophecies may be approached. They're all fulfilled in Jesus Christ and all that was spoken of about him. That would include the Lord's promise, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. It will have to do with the day that church started in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, as Luke records by inspiration. It will include then the terms of entrance into it because the church is his spiritual body. And it will point out plainly that the saved are in that church put there by the Lord himself when they believed in him, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in him, and were baptized in to Christ, Galatians 3.27, to obtain or have the remission or forgiveness of sin, Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, and verse 16. You, you cannot have the prophecies that's under consideration here pointing just to the person of Christ, for they point to far more than that. They point to all that Christ came to do and he promised to build his church. It's not just some sort of uh, side thing that he conjured up like we might do. And he had that from the beginning. The writer Paul, writing the letter to Ephesians, made it clear that this was in the eternal purpose of God for the church. Well, Christ, doing what Christ did, it's revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was in the eternal purpose of God. So it's obvious Christ without the church is ridiculous. And the church without Christ, remember Christ is the savior of the body and the body is the church. That Christ is the head of the church. Well, without either one, the way of salvation is incomplete. So when the Old Testament prophecy spoke of house of God, being established atop the mountains as Isaiah did in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. Or Daniel spoke of a kingdom that would be established that would never be destroyed, Daniel 2, 44. They couldn't figure these things out just from those kinds of prophecy. But they did know that it was for later on, just as Jesus had told the apostles, when they said, Lord, without this time, restore again the kingdom of Israel. And there's nothing to know. And we might take great heart in that because we have everything, Peter said, that pertains to life and godliness in the scripture. Well, while there's a great deal of curiosity on my part to know about heaven, to know about the situations about it, we must use sermons, as was preached tonight by Jonathan, to try to get a glimpse of heaven because there are just some things that are not to be revealed completely and adequately and fully during this time. They're to be revealed at the last time when this dispensation ends and this old world comes to a conclusion and eternity dawns. Then we will understand those things. When you read here, which now been announced unto you, or basically the way it would read, through them that preach the gospel unto you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the idea of announce, uh, the idea of declaring, comes from the idea of uh, heralding out the truth that all men need to know 
concerning how God saves man. Thus Paul would say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now it's interesting too that he would say that the angels desire to look into these things. In verse 12, we notice, let me read it all together. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister uh, this, uh, the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. With the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Let me mention that first. How do you know that the New Testament is from God and not from a bunch of folks that lived 2,000 years ago? Because of the miracles, signs, and wonders that no mortal by natural means can do. You say, well, yeah, but they did those things 2,000 years ago. But we have ample, more than adequate testimony that says that was the case. The greatest testimony we have is the fact that the men who announced Christ Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes with the Father but by him, John 14, verse 6, and that he was raised from the dead to die no more, that he at the end of time is going to bring all men to judgment. They must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or, good or bad. They would not recant on any of those things Though persecuted terribly. And Peter was one of them. And they were actually put to death, but they would not change the message. People don't knowingly tell a lie and die for what they know is a lie to begin with. They just won't do it. Not in the very nature of a normal human being to tell a lie and then have to die for it, knowing it is a falsehood, a lie. These people suffer all manner of indignities and persecutions and even death, but they would not go back on the message. Therefore, when I find that these people tell us that Jesus worked these miracles, and that the apostles worked miracles proving that what they said was from heaven and not from men, that until somebody can show they did not do so, that they lied through their teeth, that I'm going to believe it. For I have the adequate evidence, and they're certainly credible witnesses for reasons I've already stated. So the Holy Spirit is said here, even in these scriptures, to prove in his day of working miracles through the apostles and others, that this message came from God and not from man. This that we know to be the Bible in general and the New Testament specifically. Then we notice that he says, which the angels desire to look into. The word angel, of course, means um, a messenger. Angelos, the Greek, that's all it means is a messenger. Well, of course, a messenger can do a lot of things in delivering his message. And we see some of that done by angels in the Bible. Remember the work that was done by the two angels that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were messengers of God delivering condemnation to those people. These are spirit beings. The Bible says man was made a little lower than the angels. They never were made to live as we live. And it's interesting when he says which things the angels desire to look into. Well, this would include the prophecy he's just been talking about. And uh, the fulfillment of those prophecies in the Christian dispensation. Uh, this, therefore, is alluding to what he discusses in verses 10 all the way through verse 12. These heavenly messengers, these heavenly inhabitants, we don't know a whole lot about them. 
we can only know what we know about them by reading about them in the scriptures. We read that when Lazarus, the beggar, died, representative of a saved person, that the angels escorted him into Abraham's bosom, that is, into paradise, escorted his spirit, and it separated from the body on earth. Well, I've said this most often, that I don't know why we would think that's a one-time thing. Why wouldn't that be the case with all of God's children? And the Bible says that those who are his, that die faithful, are precious in his sight. Well, all the things that are burdened in this world, and especially those who have borne persecution for the cause of Christ, the moment of death, those things are lifted. And that's all gone, and there's no way for us to know the peace that comes when that time comes for the faithful child of God is death. So the angels wanted to know about these things. One thing we need to understand about these heavenly messengers uh, we find from Hebrews 1.14 that they were called ministering spirits. I don't know how all they minister, but that's what they're called by the Holy Spirit. They were sent forth to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation. Now that gets close to you and me if you're a faithful child of God. That tells me that in the providential care of the living God and the performance of God and all he's promised, to the saints, that all the way this world works, and especially for the children of God who are faithful to the cause of Christ, these angels are ministering spirits. That's a wonderful thought. And we need to take great, uh, great comfort from that because that means that God is on our side and the host of heaven is on the side of the faithful children of God. Now remember why Peter wrote this. He wants them to be comforted because of the terrible trials that are going to come upon them because they love the Lord and keep his commandments and because they're preaching the gospel and will not compromise it. They need to know that all that is in heaven is working for them, including the angels who are described by the Hebrews writer as ministering spirits. Now, if you ask me specifically, how do they minister to Christians? I don't know. Why do I need to know more than the fact that God said by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament of the Christ that they are ministering spirits that are sent to do service for the sake of them that shall inherit salvation? Well, I don't have any problem or gaining great strength from that to know that my duty simply is to continue to walk the straight and narrow way. And to not fear anyone who would seek to persecute me for teaching and living the truth. Even as Jesus said, they would kill your body. They can't touch your soul. And after all, none of us are going to be in heaven in the bodies we presently possess. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So it is that we must all leave these old corruptible bodies. And when we enter heaven, it will be in raised incorruptible bodies fitted for the heavenly realms. And I think if it's all possible, won't it be a wonderful and great thing to be able to know if such is the case of all those in heaven who ministered to us as we labored here to keep the commandments and glorify God in so doing. Now there's another interesting thing here that says that they uh, had an intense desire, that is, these angels, these ministering spirits, to understand, I think it's a good word here, the redemption that men who love the truth and obey it enjoy. The words that they look into, look into comes from one Greek word, parakupto, Paracupto, look into. It's as if you're stooping down in order to get a closer view. That's the idea. Now, we would do well to remember that angels do not understand and do not experience redemption. There's not a thing in the Bible that says that angels experience redemption when they sin. 
To the contrary, Peter will tell us plainly there, those that left their first estate, the Jews will do that too, that they're kept in chains of darkness. They don't understand being separated from God by sin and then being redeemed as if you had never seen. That's not for them. That's an amazing thing. They're trying to understand it. Now you think angels know everything, don't they? Well, no, they don't. They don't understand the matter of a whole scheme of redemption, for it's not for them. We would do well to think sometimes of the songs we sing, and it says the angels are singing redemption's sweet song. Why well, about it's nothing like that? Now, if they want to sing it along with us, I'm not going to quibble over all that regarding the song. But angels know that nothing of redemption. And they don't understand the redemption we enjoy. And they're pictured as stooping down and closely scrutinizing it, trying to grasp it. That's what the good book says. And we have to take it or leave it. And I suggest we take it as it is given to us from heaven by the Apostle Peter for the express purpose of keeping us walking the straight and narrow way. So it's used to Peter when, uh, well, you remember, when he stooped down and looked in the in the tomb, uh, the empty tomb, to try to see what was going on in there, Luke 24, 12. It's a marvelous word. It uh, suggests the act of, of leaning sideways. It's the idea of peering intently into a place or thing of interest. I think we've all done it, trying to get a better perspective and to see a thing better. So this passage is vividly describing the angel as being possessed of a, of a I don't know the word to use to modify it, a, a, a strong desire to peer into the marvelous depths of redemption and discover these amazing, great, but fundamental facts. The preposition para is used in composition with the verb whose meaning is beside, from the outside. And it certainly may be indicative of the fact that angels for whom no provision for salvation has been made, as I said earlier, are outside the realm of redemption. At least in Hebrews 2, in verse 16, for verily, verily means truly, for verily, not to angels does he give help, but he gives help to the seed of Abraham. Now, if you go back to Galatians 3, 24 through the last verse of that chapter, you'll find out who the seed of Abraham is. The seed of Abraham are the children of God. Spiritual Israel Christians who make up spiritual history. There are some things not given to the angels as great as they are that we possess. And they minister to us as ministering spirits. And they even long to understand the whole scheme of redemption. Coming on into verse 13, wherefore, and there's one of those words that says, the light of what I've been telling you, the light of what you just read, and the light of what you understand from what I've just read, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind. Well, now you have to remember how that those folks dressed. They had flowing robes, and they had girdles they wrapped around to hold the robes together. And when they would be in the field working, they would pull those robes up, and they would wrap the girdle around it so the robes wouldn't get in the way of, their, of them working. And they would tie it tight. And that's the idea here. You have a work to do. You have to face the temptations and trials that are coming your way because you are a Christian. Therefore, get your clothes on right. Get your bells up. So wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Think seriously. Look at life for what it is. The only place you're going to have a chance to get ready to go to heaven. If you miss it here, you miss it. Think that way. Examine all things, as Paul said, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, 
redeeming the time, for the days are evil. So, wherefore, gird up the Lord with your mind, be sober and hope. Look to the place of your eternal reward. Let that strengthen you as you go through these things that are that are just for a time and they'll vanish away. That you might find the strength, notice, to the end, to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where your focus needs to be. It doesn't need to be focused on today in the sense of this, but it's always going to be, it's not going to get any better. In fact, it's going to get a whole lot worse. No, for the child of God, we're just passing through. It's all going to be gone. Everything we can see with our five senses will disappear someday and be totally gone, never to be again. So God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall out of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the spirit shall out of the spirit reap life everlasting. Fundamentally, you can take that one verse and put it with what Peter's saying, and that's what he's trying to get everybody that's a Christian and undergoing persecution because of their faith to see and to understand. Notice verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. You look around the people in the United States today, and you see a lot of people that have IQs and have a whole lot of understanding about a whole lot of things. And you know, most of that's going to disappear when the elements melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works of the area and shall be burned up because it's all about the here and now and that which can be perceived in the five senses. Their whole hope is built on this present world and it cannot stand. But he's saying here, uh, put your hopes on things above, not on things on the earth. These things are passing away quickly. And you must have that which is going to preserve you under the heavenly realm. Notice they're obedient children. Not folks who say Christ exists and he's my savior, but you don't have to do what he says to do to be saved. No, as obedient children. You obeyed the truth to become a Christian and have your sins washed away. And in living the Christian life, you obey the truth pertaining to the same that you can hear someday well done by good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in every aspect of your life, your actions, and your thoughts. How can I be holy? I live as the word of God teaches me to live. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1 and verse 25. So the perfect law of liberty, that's the gospel system. That's the New Testament of Christ. That's how we're to live and we're to search it daily and apply it honestly to our lives and examine ourselves to see whether we be in the thing. And if we find a flaw, then we repent of it. We turn from it and we press on, being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, I hope these words of health will continue on, keeping in mind the general idea that Peter has, that you must undergo terrible trials sometimes, because as Paul said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So let's study this by understanding these words are designed to encourage us and show us how that we can anchor, anchor ourselves in the love of God and to strengthen our faith in God and godly faith. Would you go with me to our Heavenly Father before we as we close the class? Our Holy Father, we're grateful for everyone that's here and hope these words will Help us all to be more determined to live in view of eternity, that we'll be righteous before thee by love and obedience to the truth. May we resolve to teach it and to defend it, be with the sick and afflicted and orphans and widows, especially these of the church. Help us to love as brothers and sisters in Christ, 
and help us to recognize the brevity and uncertainty of life in the flesh and to understand eternity is a place of rejoicing if we will but live for thee here. For we pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen.